theories, member data, inline data, class data, you have heard all of that. If you have used XUnit, for sure you have seen all of those floating around there. But it can be tricky to know what they are and when to use each one of them. So picture this case. Imagine that you have a function that will validate an email and you want to test the result of a validation of a null input. You write the test, you are happy with it, but then you start asking, what about empty string? So that's an easy fix. You duplicate that test, you change the input to value, and it should have the same result. But wait, did you notice that? Yep, we duplicated code. And even knowing that sometimes duplication makes a lot of sense when writing tests, we need to keep an eye on it. And this is one of the cases where theories get in. Theories enable parameterized tests. Sometimes they are also named as data-driven tests. And what it is a data-driven test? While when writing a fact in XUnit, you are exercising a specific example with a theory, you will be able to exercise data-driven tests. You will define a set of inputs and maybe outputs that will prove your assumptions. So in other terms, a fact is kind of like one plus two, it's equal three. And the theory, it's like A plus B equals C, where each one of those letters, it's a variable that is replaced in runtime by the test framework. And how do we do parameterized tests or data-driven tests using XUnit? Using the same example that I just showed you, we can go here and we can say, okay, I only need one of those tests. So let's comment this one. And then we convert the other one to a theory. Now that we define that this is a theory, XUnit will complain because theories should have input data. They should have arguments. So we go to the method and we define the argument parameter that we are expecting. So I'm expecting an email and now I can use one of those first features that I want to show you that is inline data. To define inline data, I just need to define here nearby the theory and the method, the inline data attribute. And to that attribute, I will define all the values that I want to provide to that method. So if I have multiple arguments, I will also define multiple values. But as you remember, I want to replace two tests by one. And that is quite simple. You just need to define multiple entries of inline data, multiple attributes with each execution of the test that you are looking for. So each one of those attributes will represent a single execution of the test. Before we run the test, just use the, the value that you want. And now let's see if this works. And you can see here that it worked perfectly. So you can use inline data to this type of things, to remove duplication, to exercise the code with multiple inputs, to do triangulation, but there's another way of using inline data that is extremely useful. Let me show you another test. I have a method that will translate a given ISO code to the name of a given country. So the way that I can exercise this code instead of using a single example or doing multiple tests is that I can use inline data to define not only the input value, but also the expected output. So this way you define the table of inputs and expected outputs. What is extremely useful for this type of validations, translations, it's a really handy approach to this type of test. I use inline data a lot, but sometimes you get to a point where it's not the ideal. As an example, imagine that you have multiple tests that will be using this kind of the same data set. So this input of the ISO code and an expected output, for example. For example, imagine that you have a set of emails that you want to validate across multiple tests. How can you do it? Do you need to copy those inline data for every single test? No, there's another option that you can use that is member data. With member data, instead of defining multiple inline data attributes, we define a single one that is the member data attribute. That member data attributes will define the name of the property of the method of the field where we can get that data. And on this case is this data property. So inside of the data property, you can see that I'm providing a list. And on that list, I have a set of arguments that will be injected into that test. So when you run the test in the same way that inline data will execute the same test multiple times, one per each entry of the inline data, on member data, it will also execute one per each entry on that collection. And the only thing that you need to do is to have an I enumerable with an object array and you populate it with multiple arrays of objects. But when we see all of this object thing, we usually don't like that much right? So there's one slightly different thing that you can do. Instead of defining those objects, you can go with an approach like this one. 
where you have a given class, given record, for example, only for the test data, and you will use it here and you will inject it as an argument on the test as well. And this has a lot of advantages. For example, for maintainability, it's a better approach because on the day that you need another input for this test, for example, imagine that besides the ISO code, you need as well the region. So you can go to the country test data on this case, you add a new property, and when you compile, you will see all the tests that you need to update. But there's another use case for this member data. What if to test this method, instead of writing each one of the values and expected outputs, I could download the CSV from the internet, paste it inside of my tests, use it as a, a source file with test data and feed it to, to the test. Each line will be a test executing. You can do it because the same way that this is a property, it can be, for example, a method. So doing that will be as simple as this. You will define in the same way the member data pointing to data, and I have a, a method named data. It will return the same type of object, but this time what I'm doing is that I'm reading a given file that I have together with my tests, and I'm using CSV reader to get all the entries inside of that test. Then I will return each entry as an array of objects. And once I execute it, you will see that for 249 tests, 247 fail. Why? Because in my method, I'm only supporting two possible values. So if you want to feed your tests with data coming from a given file, a CSV, a database, or generating random data, you can do it that way. But what if I want to use this logic in multiple places? What if I want to extract it to be easier to maintain. You can do that as well. Let's go back to the email example. I have here a test that is basically checking that the given method will not accept nulls and empty strings as a possible value. From my experience, this is a pattern that you will replicate across of your application a lot of times. It's quite common to write tests to check, for example, if a string is null, empty, or in white space, for example. On those cases, you can take advantage of another feature that is the class data. And what is that? A class data is a kind of a member data. The type of implementation is kind of the same, but you will extract it as a class. So I can create a class data for this type of use case. So I can create a class with a name with something like empty string parameters. It should implement I enumerable of object of A, like the member data one. Then we implement the interface. And inside of this get enumerator, we will define all the examples that you want to provide to the tests that use this class data. So in my case, I will return a null and also a string empty. This means that now I can go back to my test and replace the inline data or the member data that you have been using for this class data. Not only that, but I can grab this class data attribute using the same class that I just created, go to my ISO converter and use it as well. Because if I want to check that that function that does the translation does not accept an empty ISO code, I can use the same data sets as input. So this is quite handy. And this is a small example that you will see in your tests everywhere, but it applies to a lot of things. For example, that list of countries can be used in multiple tests. So if you want to share it and better organize, you can take advantage of class data. So in simple terms, you define inline data to provide a set of static values as input for a test. The test will run as many of entries you have on that inline data. If you want to share inside of the same test class those inputs, or if you need some dynamic thing to provide those values, you will use member data. And then if you want to better organize your test data and you need to extract it to reuse it, you use class data. And now that you have mastered X unit theories, make sure you watch this video right here. But before you go, let me know in the comments if you'd like to see another deep dive on an X unit feature.